This is Tim. I'm Lily. And this is Critiquing Comics. Welcome to Critiquing Comics. This is Tim with Mulele in Tokyo. Um, and Mulele, how are you doing today? I'm um, doing well. And you? Um, okay, coughing a little bit. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we had you know, Golden Week here in Japan, um, which ended uh, on Monday the 6th was the last day. But then for some reason, my schedule did, my school didn't schedule me on the 7th. And we're recording now on the 10th and I'm off today too because the students are having tests so nice nice short week but yeah so we're uh, we've got a couple more comics this time first one is Off Girl uh, written by Tina Fine and drawn by Mark Rahill um, I actually read the first three issues mm. um the f- now the first page of the first issue um, is explanatory text, and to me that's always kind of a red flag. Um, first of all, just because comics readers generally don't like to read pages of text uh-huh. and tend to skip them, uh, I did read it. Uh, the first paragraph um, is kind of relevant to the story, and the rest of it is just thank yous, but. Uh, The first paragraph says, Julia Davenport knew something was wrong, very wrong. You see, there seemed to be a connection with her orgasms and men dying. I would say between her orgasms and men dying. Uh, She took meds and faked her O's, but one unfortunate day, something went terribly wrong. And that set her off on a journey to becoming NYC's newest superhero off girl. Um, Now... So I read the text, and the problem now is that I'm still confused when I'm reading the comic. Oh. Um, So, first of all, we get the very first page, there are two women in a bar, and it wasn't quite clear to me which one was going to be off girl. I guess if you read the whole page and pay attention to the names, you can get it. But also just kind of the panels on this page, I was having trouble following the sequence between them. I actually considered first, is this supposed to be like manga? <laughs> right mm-hmm. to left? Let's try reading it that way. No. <laughs> um, it just, I found it, it just, the there wasn't enough continuity from panel to panel to quite follow what was happening. And that same thing happened in other parts of the three issues that I read. Mm. Um. But um, the one who is, does turn out to be Julie, she's saying, I can't be with anybody. I'm a disaster. Mm. And it wasn't clear to me, you know, having read the introduction, it wasn't clear to me if that was because when she sleeps with guys, they die, or just because she doesn't have good luck. Is that happening already? The, they are. It's unclear to me from that page. Mm. Um, then she goes home and there's this hunky guy with flowers on her doorstep. Um, she sleeps with him. Then she runs to the restroom, tells herself, calm down, you'll be fine. And then in the next panel, she's looking at the toilet and says, oh no. And I couldn't understand what was happening until several pages later, it was explained that she dropped her pills in the toilet. And I went back and looked, and yeah, there are a few pills floating in the toilet, and there's an empty pill bottle on its side, but there, there's no shot of pills actually being spilled, mm. which you really need, I think, to communicate that the pills were spilled, or at least show a lot more pills uh, in the toilet or on the floor uh, than there were in that panel. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's also this guy running around killing women. They call him the stiletto killer. And apparently he kidnaps the women first and makes them wear underwear and high heels and chains them to treadmills. And they're supposed to just keep running, which I was kind of like, what? 
<laughs> uh, just like why I, I just found that mysterious um and i don't know i just kind of went on like that and i kind of followed the story but then there were places where i just couldn't get what was going on um well what did you think story wise i have some things to say about the art too but what do you think of the story well i have to confess i i read the first issue and that that was all i had time for but um uh and i i looked at the second issue but I didn't read it. Um, so that first issue is a bit of a, a, a mess in, in that um, narratively it doesn't quite make sense. Mm-hmm. If it were not for that first paragraph, I would no idea what the story was because it's not clear to me that, you know, when she has an orgasm, other people die. And um, she doesn't even have to have any sort of like um, penetrative sex in order to kill a person that scene on the subway where she's just rubbing on a pole and she orgasms and, and some guys around her die. Mm -hmm. That, that, um, means that there's some sort of like area effect, um, some pheromones and, and those guys are dead. I don't know, but, um, basically the mechanism of her, whatever, is kind of not really well explained. And um, the fact that uh, one guy didn't die. Yeah, well, that is uh, explained somewhat in the following two issues that I read. Um, But it was like there was an explanation, and then they got to the third issue, and then I felt like there was now another explanation and there was some argument whether the first explanation was correct or not. Mm. And so it just, the the third issue really got to be a mess because there were a few pages there where it was just, each scene was one panel and it, it started to feel like I was reading the trailer for the comic rather than reading the comic. Well, um, it, it's, a, it's actually a, a problem that I had with the artist. The artist does draw quite well, but he's not a comic book artist he's an illustrator mm. and he's that that illustrator he's kind of like uh nagel from back in the oh in, yeah the, like the duran duran album cover yeah yeah you draw that one girl perfectly in that one pose and anything else is a bit too much of an ask and so there's a there's a lot of that kind of feeling here that because like the two girls talking at the beginning of issue one they look the same, and I kept confusing which was which. That's a big problem. As they get to be more and more characters, that becomes an even worse problem. Characters that look too much like each other. Yeah, and, you know, it. it eventually I kind of got to it and understood, okay, well, this character is, is probably the character. But, um, like, the two girls talking at the bar, and then one of them goes home with the guy, and I was like, okay, which character was this, and, and what's her deal, and... But there's also an, an underlying psychology here that I thought was really weird. Hmm. Here's a woman who knows that when she has an orgasm, people die around her. Yet she actively seeks out sex. So she's in a bar and she's thinking she can control it with meds. But at the same time, she did she drop her meds or did, he, did she flush her meds? Well, it looked like it was an accident. She said, oh, no. Um, but yeah, that, that was, it is kind of puzzling. Yeah, you're right. I mean, she, she seems to, you know, she wants to have sex. She fakes the orgasm. She takes the pills to suppress them. And then she sits in the bar and complains. Um, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what her, what her goal is here. And what is the psychology of, um, not being not being able to have sex uh, for the want of not killing the the other person, and then faking your orgasm. So if you're not actually getting off, then what's the point? Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it seems like she's just incredibly lonely. It's, it's really really lonely that she's willing to risk the life of her partners just so she can solve that loneliness problem and fake an orgasm to kind of make it there's so much psycho psychological junk buried in that 
that it's just like, man, this 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 is kind of fucked. Um, Figuratively. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pun was not intended. But anyway, um, the the the, um, the the story the story behind that psychology is much more interesting than any sort of superhero story. <laughs> Um, but I think the writer didn't quite recognize that as an issue um, and and was more set on this adult hero thing. Another problem I had was if you're going to do a comic like this where sex is the main point of the story, a nipple, a butt, a vagina, pen- penetration, some some dicks, whatever, it should all be there. It's, yeah, they're always wearing underwear in the bedroom scenes. And and they're always covered up. And mm-hmm. it's it's perhaps there's a point of um sexiness to it uh that they're going for, but I just found it like why though? It just yeah, it felt odd to me too. I think it's in the third issue. She's like go, running around sleeping with guys and yeah, there's there's they're always just in their underwear. Yeah, um you know, I I, I in general, I have a problem with superhero comics that really push towards the sexuality or, or um, the kind of showing off the, the, the body. Um, I'm not so interested in that. I'm, I'm much more interested in the practicality of, of, of it all. Um, give me realistic superheroes, for lack of a better word. But um, Back in the 90s, when uh, Image Comics used to draw women's breasts with a, an ellipses, um, that kind of stuff was just dumb. And I knew it was dumb then. Um, and this is kind of on that level of, well, if you're going to do that, just do that. Just be, be, be forward about it. I mean, there is a certain um, comparison, I felt that you could make between this and Mila Manara's uh, click where this woman has some, I forget the story in detail, but they, they do something where they put this little thing in hers. So every time they turn this dial or click this switch, um, she becomes super horny at inopportune times. Mm. And it's, um, graphic in it's sex scenes. Um, but there is something a little bit, I don't know, I saw some sort of similarity between this and that. Um, but um, this one just seemed to not go in any sort of natural direction. It has this kind of weird, um, you know, we're going to talk about sex, but we're not going to show sex kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it, it didn't work for me on many, many levels. The art is beautiful, but it's not comic art. Well, the other thing about the art, I mean, it seemed pretty clear that it was photo referenced, like a lot of it. Um, And I think maybe kind of as a result of that, every single character is young and hot. Even you get into the second issue, these young adult characters, parents also look young and hot. (laughs) They're like, they're too young to be the parents of these other characters. Uh all of them. <laughs> yeah. It's it's bizarre. And you know there there are no ugly characters anywhere in this comic. There's nobody who looks older than 30 35. It's it's fashion magazine land. It's not the real world. Um yeah, that that might have been a point though for for the artist or for the um the the producer of the comic. But uh, I think it's kind of a a bad stylistic choice. Now, unless unless the the parent is going to be put in some sort of sexual thing where you need the reader to um, enjoy that on that level, there's no point in making the parent sexy. Yeah. Um, just keep it focused on the on, and you might, at that point you might as well be uh, drawing sexy tables, <laughs> even though the, the table's not going to have sex. If it's got to look good all the time, then, you know, well, what's the point? Um, so, yeah, it, it, for, for me, after, after a really, really confusing first issue, um, I, I was not interested in, in checking out the second issue. 
um, and I wasn't going to kind of force feed it. Um, mm -hmm. But it sounds like it didn't it didn't improve that much. No. Well, an another thing I noticed about it was it seemed like there were a number of places where in one panel something's about to happen and then the next time we see them the thing has happened yeah and you know the payoff scene is missing the payoff panel like i think is it issue one or two when they're driving and there's a big semi truck coming straight for them hmm. and then we switch to somebody else for a few panels and we come back and their car is in the ditch um, okay. <laughs> we didn't see the the near collision with the truck, which just seemed odd. Mm. And it made me wonder if the artist didn't have photo reference for that and so didn't draw it. Yeah, see, that that's a, that's a big problem. Um, there were other places like that, too, where it just felt like something was, you know, a, a, the main thing that was supposed to happen was missing and we were just seeing before and after. Oh. Mm. Hmm. Anyway, so yeah, this this uh, kind of needs to be in in part. It's kind of the same problem as uh, Raptor Cop, uh, where it's just things are not set up and explained well enough. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's it's kind of the problem of uh, the creators knowing what the story is, but forgetting to completely explain it to the reader. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that that's, you know, an editor is needed here. I think there was no editor. Um, I don't think so. I didn't see a mention of one, but yeah, I think you're all right. It does need an editor. If, if there isn't one, definitely get on that. Um, writers make the worst editors of their own writing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, definitely, and and someone who's not your friend, because friends don't necessarily push you hard in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. There's no editor credited; just the writer and the artist. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, the thing is, though, this is a comic book that does none of the heavy lifting of of comics, and so if if the writer uh, or artist were to go back and fix some of the problems that we mentioned, there's a lot of heavy lifting to be done there because this is, this is a comic without any of that. Um, that truck scene, for example, you show the truck, you show the car, it looks like something's about to happen, but they don't have the budget for the special effects of the, of the car crash. So they just <laughs> next scene cut to car in a ditch. Um, and that's, that's some like super low budget seventies, uh, Super 8 film stuff. And so, yeah, there's a lot there that has to be done um, to, to make that scene uh, that perhaps the artist is not willing to do. Um, certainly doesn't seem unable, but yeah. just to be unwilling. Mm hmm Unless the writer is like, no, fuck that page. Let's just get to the, get to the ditch because that's where the real the real need of my story is. Um, so in that, in that sense, um, either the writer or the artist, um, has to kind of, um, reconsider some of, some of it. I would say it starts with the writer, but there's a, there's an art problem here too. If you enjoy comics analysis on deconstructing comics and critiquing comics or bat discussion on to the bat polls, Support our shows by pledging a monthly donation at patreon.com slash deconcomics. Pledge at least $4 a month and you'll get access to our bi-weekly show, Spider-Man 1963, a look at the first year of Amazing Spider-Man. Coming out tomorrow, Patrick and I discuss Spidey's battle against the Big Man and the Enforcers in issue 10. Here's a sample of what our patrons will be getting. Yeah, I mean, the, the way... Jonah was written back then. He didn't really have any j journalistic integrity at all. I think you know, as the series went by, he start, sort of got some. But at this point, you know, it's it's all about his vendetta, and it doesn't matter if he has any proof or not. He's just sure. Well, I mean, yeah, I guess I kind of look at it like uh, you know, you 
uh, the early 60s and Marvel, I mean, I think they probably were pretty blown away by uh, how much success they started having and then just, you know, were just putting things out willy-nilly. You mm -hmm. know? It's like uh, uh, just taking the issues as they came came up, not really doing any kind of forward planning, you know, mm -hmm. uh, until... Well, like, you know, it says the uh, the Aunt May blood transfusion. That was obviously they were thinking about doing something in the future with that. Uh, and uh, also Betty. But it just seems like they're, you know, taking it one issue at a time <laughs> and trying to work out. You know, hope they didn't flub up anything. For more analysis of the early Lee Ditko Spider-Man, pledge at least $4 a month to support our shows at patreon.com slash deconcomics. Now back to the show. Okay, uh, our second comic is Sneaky Goblins um, by Rene Fitzner. Uh, Rene is a man. I looked at the about page, uh, R-E-N-E. -E. Mm. Um, and uh, Sneaky Goblins is about a goblin named Dank who flunks out of assassin school. Um, he needs a job and answers an ad for an assassin. Although it's a little odd because, well, it's apparently the mob who has uh, placed the ad um but what they need really is a thief rather than an assassin i didn't quite understand why they needed an assassin mm. um he's supposed to steal this treasure from the elves so he sets out on this mission and then of course you know a lot of things happen along the way on this mission and he you know meets people and they join him or don't or at least temporarily join him in some cases. Um, yeah, I I got to page 86 of this. I just kept reading. Um, I had very little bad to say about it other than just a few misspellings. Mm. Um, but yeah, I thought the, the comic was uh, pretty engaging. Um, the art is kind of cartoony. Uh, it's not a comedy. There are humorous moments here and there, but um, it's, you know... A, straight adventure story with you know yeah some humor in it um what did you think of it um i thought for the humor aspect i thought there were a lot of missed opportunities where they could have really pushed the um uh like the stuff with the the, the big orc and the stuff the stuff with the mob mobsters in in the town um there's some mild humor there but it's mild mm-hmm and the stuff with the big orc with the ukulele, um, if there was humor there, it was too mild for me. And mm -hmm. I, I think there are a couple of scenes where they could have pushed towards, you know, pushed it up towards 11, but they didn't. They, they kept it around seven or so, uh, and sometimes less than five. And so um, I feel like there are a couple of missed opportunities with the humor. Mm -hmm. and stuff. A lot of the drawing reminds me of um, Sergio Aragones. Oh yeah. Um, there's a lot of uh, kind of guru in in it, but it could just be the world that it's in. It, it's definitely not the 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 pen line or the amount of detail. Um, not necessarily even um, the the uh, framing of things, but it just has that kind of cartoony um, style to it. The artwork itself is really beautiful. I, I, I make no mistake about that. And it is quite accomplished. The color is lovely. Um, it's simple in its design, but it's quite effective in its execution. Mm -hmm. um, the story is also fine, except for one uh, bit that I had with it. Um, the... The idea of orcs as a society going to university to do bad things um, when none of the things that they actually do in, in their jobs seem to be really bad. And so we have, um, I guess, let me put it like um, we have evil university. And once you graduate from evil university, you can become whatever you want. One of the things they suggest is uh, he becomes defender of the town, which isn't a particularly evil 
occupation. <laughs> yeah. um, and then we have these evil mobsters who do, do evil things. But this guy, the, the hero of the comic, who flunks out of evil school, then goes to do an assassin job, turns out to be a thieving job. When he's not qualified for thieving or assassination, he's actually just a chemist. That's what he excelled in, uh, making poisons. And so I, I kind of don't see how this would go well anyway. But then he's sent on a quest to do a bad thing for some bad people. He's got no problems with the bad thing and the bad people. And even killing a couple of people along the way seems to be fine. Yeah. Yeah. And he meets some other bad people along the way who are going to help him in his bad quest. At what point am I supposed to look at this character and say, yeah, I'm behind him. Mm -hmm. I believe in his quest or I believe in him. And and that's the problem I had. 55 pages in, I was like, who is this fucker? <laughs> why, why, why should I care if him or his father gets killed? Because his father seems kind of like a schmo, and this guy too, but he gives no fuck about other people. Barely gives a fuck about himself. And so, I'm just going like, what? where's the in for me? Yeah, I see what you mean. I, I Now that I think about it, I had a little trouble kind of really identifying with him. You know, he's... Yeah, he's trying to do something bad, and he's killing... Yeah, actually, I got to page 86. He kills quite a few people uh, along the way. Um, yeah, it might have worked a little better if his quest were uh, not uh, uh, a crime, basically. Yeah, so let me, let me suggest a couple of fixes here. Um, number one, set up that the, the orcs are not evil... They are just a species. And so they're not going to evil university. They're going to regular university. And he gets mixed in with some mobsters that are bad guys. Um, and um, how he gets mixed up with them is also fine. I didn't have too much of a um, too much of a problem with it. it, it, it the, the reason for him going on the quest more than his own skin or the skin of his family it's not quite enough he needs to be righteous at some point in this quest otherwise he's not a hero he's just an asshole and if you can if you can write that then you're okay it has to be somewhere in the beginning um or there has to be some lesson early enough in the story that he begins to change his way because basically what I see is that he, he's got no talent in any of this stuff. His one buddy gets killed catching chickens because he fucked up. Um, and then he knows he can't do the quest alone. So he kind of dupes this other muscular orc into fighting for him. When that guy gets clobbered by the music, magician, I almost said musician, uh, <laughs> gets clobbered by the magician, He's like, okay, okay, I give up. Let me explain why I'm doing this. I've got no beef with you, even though I'm trying to kill you. But since you won, let me try and mea culpa my way out of this. And the person winds up joining his quest. I'm like, what, what the fuck is this? <laughs> I, would, I would just kill the person and, and, or kill the orc and, and, and be fine. Um, and so and, and, unless there's some lesson to be had there. Rather than he's a smarmy, um, untalented idiot who is going to do a bad job uh, while killing people who were basically not trying to hurt him. Mm -hmm. there, there's absolutely no sympathy I have for this character or his quest. And so it's a little bit, it kind of kills the story for me there. Mm -hmm. But everything else, the pacing of the story... In general, the writing is is fine, except for those details. And um, even in some places, the humor is fine. Although I thought there could be more of it, considering the art style. Um, so, in that sense, yeah. 
it, 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 it's missing just a, a one or two scenes at the beginning to kind of make it all right. Uh, otherwise, it's like, man, no. Um, this girlfriend uh, seems kind of um, interesting, but I have no idea what she's going to be doing because I'm only at page 55. But 55 pages in, and if I still don't have uh, sympathies for the characters, that's a third of the book. Um, we're in trouble. I should have sympathies in the first 10 pages. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I as it, I can't remember exactly where it was. You might not be to that point yet. But um, when he's traveling with the orc and the magician, um, and they have a lot of battles apparently along the way, but the comic just kind of skips over them. We see like one panel of this battle and one panel of that battle. Right. And I can understand you know, wanting to get on with the story. Um, but at the same time, I kind of felt like I was missing out on something that I, I wanted to see what happened. You know, another kind of missed opportunity, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, you could do you could do uh, those as separate comics and put them on Patreon or something, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about the the um, the two headed what's it on a, on a rhinoceros and the dragon and the birds? Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah. I can't remember exactly where that was, but yeah, there were enough, a number of creatures that they fought, but we didn't see the actual battles. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I understand why he did it that way. I wouldn't have done it that way because I kind of, um, like you said, would want to see a little bit more of the battle. Um, it could have been structured a little bit differently, at least to have one of those battles be more of like a, uh, a thing than one panel. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think the artist was kind of in a hurry to get through the thing so much that they didn't enjoy the journey enough. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I don't know. I, I, I feel like there's a lot of potential here, but it, the story needs some editing and some... Um, uh, sympathy infusion. Mm -hmm. Okay, and of course, uh, both of these comics are linked in the show notes. Uh, Mulele, do you have any questions? Um, actually, about these comics uh, yeah. being linked in the show notes, are, are are they for sale or for for free preview or what? What's well, the, uh... so Sneaky Goblins is a web comic. Um, okay, so it's right there for anybody. The other one, I'll, I'm going to have to check on how this is. Um, I mean, we were given a different URL for each issue, mm -hmm. um, which is a little awkward. I'm going to, uh, as I'm putting this one up, I'll have to see what the best way to to uh, link to it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, a webcomic. If it's a webcomic, I can kind of see a little bit more how you... Because uh, let me... Let me um, amend my, my critique just a little bit <laughs> as a web comic. And, and I've, I've done this. Um, some people will, um, set up their characters, set up the world and just go. And the story kind of naturally evolves. And there's something really interesting about that kind of thing. But when you read it as a completed work, some of it doesn't make sense. Hmm. Um, you may have a general structure like, okay, here's the quest. On the quest, we go. And whatever happens, happens. And from week to week, it's different. And there's no telling what will happen uh, because none of it's written uh, beyond the end goal. Mm -hmm. In this case, get the magic MacGuffin and um, save your family, basically. Yeah. Sorry, one, one, one last critique. Um, before he meets with the wizard and, and the other orc, he's out in the wilderness for a week. And I'm just thinking, this mafia guy is fucking patience of Job <laughs> <laughs> for his magic MacGuffin. Not that he needs it for anything. I don't know. He just wants it. But, um, yeah, it just seems it, it just seemed kind of random. And then later in the comic, there's like, okay, and two months later, so, okay, so now this person's been waiting, what, two and a half, three months, and the quest isn't over. So it seems like there's a, a kind of a, a, a no time limit at all, no, no need to get this thing 
done and back to the mafia so the mafia doesn't hunt down the father and kill him or die of old age while they're waiting <laughs> yeah that too <laughs> um but anyway um i'm currently attempting a second web comic it's not it's not um i haven't announced it anywhere i haven't put it up anywhere um i've drawn a couple of pages but I've been writing for a long time and I've kind of come to the realization um, or I, I came to it a while ago, a couple of years ago, but the first web comic that I did, um, I split up into four parts. Uh, this is Mind Gator. So Mind Gator, I, I um, had an idea for where it was going to go. I did 52 pages, 55 pages worth of comic. And then when it came time to print the comic, I threw out the last 30 pages, 30 pages. No, this is 20, 20, 20 something pages. And basically had a 30 page comic that I printed as issue one. Hmm. Then understanding what that issue one was, I went back and redid issue two. There were some other things though. Some, some, um, plot, shifts that I made in the story uh, because the webcomic was getting kind of boring. Um, and um, then finished issue two, printed that, and now I'm, I'm plotting issues three and four. It's taking a long time and I'm not doing it online anymore because really I kept writing myself into a corner or I, I just didn't know how to wrap it up cohesively because I had no story idea per se, or I rather I did, but then suddenly I took a left turn and I was off in uncharted territory. And now I, I, I have no way to get my way, uh, find my way back. I mean, I've, I've now plotted to the end of that, that thing. And now I've got two issues left to draw, but as I'm planning my next web comic, I'm like, no, I'd rather write every episode all the way to the end and then go a couple of times revising this thing and have it be a finite story. But at the end of it, you can look at it and say, wow, that's really well measured. Um, it makes sense. It didn't run on forever. Uh, and it's a great work without going back and rewriting half of it. And so for this web comic, I can kind of see where he did it the way I did it the first way set up a quest and off he went and now kind of looking at it. Okay. There are a couple of problems that are helping, uh, hindering my enjoyment of this. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and, but it's because we reading it now is a graphic novel. Um, and it looks like he collected the pages, but didn't correct anything or go back and rethink anything. It, 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 it still has flaws is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. But man, a fucking, uh, web a color web comic yeah yeah it's on color it's in sorry it's in color on the site yeah yeah that 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 is amazing so artistically kudos man i would love to do a color web comic but you know if, if everybody can wait a year per page <laughs> um, i should be done sometime after i die um <laughs> but anyway um yeah, I kind of, I kind of see where, what happened, but he, he needs to go back and rework a little bit. You like cheap comic books, right? Well, I'm Professor Allen, and I talk about cheap comic books on the Quarterbin Podcast. In every episode, I'll dissect a single comic from my collection, as long as I paid no more than twenty-five cents for the issue. Forget about four-dollar new comics that you can read in four minutes or crossover events that can cost a hundred bucks to collect. Join me in the quarter bin, where even bad comics are a bargain, and good ones are a steal. The Quarter Bin Podcast is part of the Relatively Geeky Podcast Network. Visit us at relativelygeekypodcast.blogspot.com or search Relatively Geeky or Quarter Bin Podcast in iTunes. I guarantee it'll be worth every penny.
If you'd like us to critique your comic, send a PDF or a link to mail at deconstructingcomics.com and we'll read at least 30 pages of it and critique it on the show. Um, and anything else you want to add? Um, no, not not really. Um, but actually, I do want to ask you just in general, um, now that Endgame has come out and uh, it's, it's the second highest grossing movie in in history as long as you don't count gone with the wind uh, adjusted for inflation um i think gone with the wind adjusted for inflation is like a three billion dollar film mm. but um now that it's made all the money in the world this year do you have any feelings about the mcu or any of it um well, my my uh, sense of superiority for not knowing anything about it has been kind of tempered by wishing that I could go see it without not knowing what the hell was going on. Um, <laughs> so I've become a little more interested in, in trying to catch up, but, I mean, it's going to be long gone from the theaters by the time I <laughs> can manage to catch up. Yeah, yeah. Well, your schedule is pretty pretty hard the, the way you have it set up. So yeah, well, and it's it's been I've made it worse for myself here recently because I after um after I don't know if I told you about this that I went to this uh Batman conference uh at Bowling Green State University. Uh-huh. Um which the main reason I went was for to the bat poles, but I ended up getting a lot of inspiration for deconstructing comics episodes. Mm. Um, and well, as well as some, uh, to the bat pole stuff. And so I, I, and then other things came up too. And so I'm like trying to read this for this podcast and read the something else for that podcast. And so <laughs> I'm really keeping myself busy with preparing for podcast episodes here lately. Nothing brutalizes a schedule so wonderfully as inspiration. Yeah. <laughs> well put. <laughs> Yeah, but but um, it's good to be inspired, and I, and I think it's fine. It's unfortunate you won't see uh, Endgame in the theater because that's a that's a that's a theater going experience if I've ever had one. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you're seeing it with a whole bunch of people who haven't seen it before. Mm -hmm. I should say in America, in Japan, people are pretty silent. Yeah, and clap at the end. Um, actually, when I went, a lot of people were just like, "Oh, bathroom, bathroom." <laughs> it's a, a fucking three-hour movie. Yeah, um, seeing a movie in Japan is completely different from seeing one in America. I don't know if our listeners realize that, except the ones who live in Japan. But, yeah, I mean, I hear about people you know, in America who, like, I went to see this movie and everybody cheered at this certain point and, like, well, I saw that movie in a the theater and there was silence all the way through. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I went I to see believe... Wayne's World in a Japanese theater. I was the only person who was laughing. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I, I've had that a lot of times. Um, actually, I was the only one laughing at Terminator 3. Some guy kicked my chair because I was laughing so much. It's like fucking Arnold Schwarzenegger swinging off the back of some sort of truck getting smashed through buildings. Uh, he, it was filmed like a comedy. Of course I'm going to laugh. The guy's like, no, this is a serious action flick. It's like, motherfucker, this is Arnold Schwarzenegger. What do you think this is? Well, oh, I, I laughed at, at Toy Story 3. I was with my kids, and they were all kind of embarrassed that I was laughing so much because they were concerned with, like, not disturbing anyone else around them. Like, well, it's a comedy, so <laughs> why do yeah. you go see a comedy in the theater if you're not going to laugh out loud? Well, actually, the, the I heard that everybody cried at the end of uh, Toy Story 3. Well, that's it's... true, too. I did also, but... <laughs> you cried. Yeah. See... Man, my, my eyes got extra dry at the end of Toy Story Three. Maybe it's because I'm dead inside, but um, it didn't it didn't hit me. Are you are you excited at all for Toy Story Four? Yeah, I'm gonna see it. I don't even know what's gonna happen in it, but I'm gonna see it. Okay, but I mean, you 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 want to see that? Yeah, I mean, I've I've followed it this far. I've I've been following that much much more. Of course, they don't put out nearly as many movies as the MCU, but I've been keeping up on that and i i saw both of the uh, incredibles movies too if they i wish they put put out one of those every year i'd go see it <laughs> yeah um it, it, people are saying it's kind of like the the fantastic four but done correctly yeah 
Yeah. Um, no, I, I, I dug Incredibles 1 and 2. Um, well, when they make them, I'll watch them. But for me, right now, I'd rather watch an MCU Fantastic Four, so I'm, I'm waiting for that. Is that ever going to happen? I guess, were, were they owned by, were the rights to FF owned by Fox? Yeah. And okay, now, so now there's a merger, so... Yeah, the only the only thing that's a little bit weird is that after this next uh, Spider-Man film, um, the rights to Spider-Man, uh, rather the agreement to have Spider-Man in the MCU, ends. Mm. And so there's a question: Will there be a Spider-Man three? Will Spider-Man simply no longer appear after this next Spider-Man movie, or is Disney going to have to sell half the Earth just to get the rights back? Um, because I mean, Disney and, and, um, is it Sony who owns Spider-Man? Yeah. Are in, in some sort of reluctant agreement that Spider-Man would be better over at, um, at Disney and with Marvel. But then after they made that agreement, they had uh, Into the Spider-Verse, which won a fucking Oscar for Best Animated Feature. <laughs> uh, and they had Spawn, which everybody agrees is trash, but fun trash. And so it made a lot of money. And so suddenly... Oh, you mean Spider- Venom? You mean Venom? I'm oh, sorry, when I say Spawn? Yeah, you said yeah. Spawn. Yeah, Venom. Uh, same difference, man. Uh, bad special <laughs> uh, shit story. And um, just too goofy for school, but somehow making money. Man, Spawn is supposed to be making a return, too. I'm just like, what? Why? <laughs> but anyway, different story for a different time. Um, but, um, yeah, after, after all of that, um, there's a real question as to, well, what is the value for Sony to actually share Spider-Man with the MCU? Um, if, if they now have an understanding of what Spider-Man is and how to work it, Maybe they just take him back and make their own money and um, do the Spider-Verse, Spider, Spider-Man Spider universe uh, as kind of an expanded thing. So, who knows? Yeah, or Disney buys Sony. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I, I don't think that's going to happen too soon. Yeah, yeah. probably not. Hmm. Okay, so... Uh, Till next time, this is Tim. And Malele. Thanks for listening to Critiquing Comics. Our theme is from bensound.com. It's finally here, premiering on Patreon this Saturday, an occasional series, Tim Catches Up on the MCU. I finally watched the 2011 film Thor, and Malele and I discuss it this Saturday. As I move forward with the series, when I can find time, we'll proceed through the rest of the Marvel movies. Our Thor discussion is available starting this Saturday to patrons pledging at least $4 a month. Next week on Deconstructing Comics, I talk to three comics creators about their recent or ongoing Kickstarter projects, including our friend Ron Randall in Portland, who's continuing his long-running series Trekker through Kickstarter. See you then!